the question that I explored in sacred economics is what would an economic system look like if it embodied the new story? And, and, and fostered the new story. Because our current economic system, it creates separation, puts us into competition with each other, casts us into the world of the separate self, and it drives endless growth. So the ambition was that eventually we would completely conquer nature, uh, you know, have synthetic food and robot body parts and space colonies and no longer even need nature. That was our destiny, to transcend, um, to rise above our animal origins into the realm of spirit, into the realm of mind. You know, a more evolved person was somebody who wasn't, you know, involved in, in the dirt and the flesh and the commerce, right? The more evolved person sat in, in pure meditation on a white blanket or something like that, you know, and didn't, didn't sully his hands and feet with the dirt and with messy relationships. Like that was, or, or in the secular world, we had like the, the scientist, you know, the philosopher, the mathematician in this pure realm of mind making decisions based on reason, uh, overcoming biology with ethics and, and willpower and things like that. Uh, winning the war against the self. So, again, um, in the new story, we are no longer the conquerors of nature. Therefore, endless growth no longer fits that story. Endless growth means the conversion of the world into property. In the new story, we are perhaps the co-creative partners of nature. We become members of ecology and not exceptions to ecology, which, mean we, which means we obey the laws of ecology. For example, that, that waste is food, that there's no such, in, in the rest of nature, there's no such thing as a waste product that's not usable to some other form of life or other process of Gaia. Only humans create such things, uh, radioactive waste, you know, plutonium, stuff like that. Um, so, an economics that embodies the new and ancient story no longer encourages that kind of linear extraction and waste dumping, but is cyclical, um, is zero waste, uh, and enriches uh, ecosystems rather than destroying them. You know, and this is a place that, that um, on an individual level, many of us are already moving toward this. Um, what is exciting to an idealistic young person? 50 years ago, it was the conquest of nature. You know, you wanted to be a, or 100 years ago even, you wanted to be a, a nuclear scientist, you know, you wanted to be an astronaut, you wanted to be, you wanted to invent a faster way to cut down the trees. And if you did that, you'd be a hero. You didn't have to apologize. Today, the really um, the amazing young people I'm meeting, they want to go into permaculture. You know, they want to go into ecosystem restoration. They want to go into social justice. The, 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 the project of, of conquering nature is no longer exciting because our consciousness is shifting already. The money system still very much represents the old story. So if you do things, if your passion is not to uh, dig a strip mine, but instead it's to restore an ecosystem damaged by the strip mine, you're not gonna make very much money. There's still a lot more money in digging strip mines because the money system is aligned with the old story and everything that we do in the old story. So we have we're in kind of um, a difficult situation where our, um, our hearts, our consciousness has moved on, but we're still in a society that has institutionalized our old consciousness, which means that there may be no ready-made place for you 
if you're acting from what you really care about. That's why I think that, that change on all levels is necessary, not only the personal, psychological, spiritual level, but also the systems level. Because how long can you maintain a different consciousness when you're surrounded by the pressures, the systemic pressures of the old world? So we need to change our systems as well. For example, um, internalizing ecological costs so that, for example, pollution becomes very expensive so that the best business decision is identical to the best ecological decision. Um, a lot of complexities there. Uh, severe problems with monetizing ecosystem services. It can be a very dangerous thing, but the basic idea is to align profit with ecological health, which is very different from the concept of sustainable growth or green growth, which I think is an oxymoron. You know, like growth in nature is not sustainable. Growth is part of nature, but it reaches a limit and then it transitions to a steady state and a different kind of development happens. I think that, so a human being goes through that when they reach adolescence and our species now, I believe, is entering adolescence or in the midst of adolescence. Uh, and already our population growth has slowed down considerably and shows signs of leveling off um, sometime later this century. Um, so that's not to say that we stagnate, but that we grow or evolve uh, in a different way. Uh, so we're reaching adolescence, I think, and the end of the growth phase. But our systems only work in the context of growth. So that leads to another piece of sacred economics, which is to have a money system that works without growth, which means that you can't create money as interest-bearing debt anymore. Um, and there are different proposals for how to do that. Uh, one is called positive money, where <clears throat> money's not created by lending, it's just created by fiat, by, by the government probably, or by some um, collective entity. Um, another idea that, that I explore uh, in more depth is the idea of negative interest. Um, money that has a decay rate built into it so that it obeys the law of return in ecology, all things eventually decay and return to their source. Today, money is an exception to the law of nature. It grows, in fact, uh, because of interest, faster than inflation, if you have enough of it to invest it in risk-free securities, which if you have enough money, everything's risk-free because you'll get bailed out if the investment fails. <laughs> so money um, disobeys a fundamental law the law of impermanence. Uh, it seems, and, and everybody on some level knows that you can't take your money with you, that yourself is not your money, but we behave very much as if it were. As, as if, if we had enough money and enough security in our investments, we would live forever. Uh, a very sad delusion when you know, you're on your deathbed and you realize you can't take your money with you and what's valuable to you then? What what gives you joy in those moments? It's certainly not the things that you accumulated and can't take with you. It's the things that you gave that will outlast you in the world. Um, so that deathbed realization coincides with the principle of Ubuntu, that, that um, your wealth lies in what you give, not in what you have. And it kind of reenacts the dynamics of a um, sharing hunter-gatherer society uh, in which possessions were something of a burden if you were nomadic or even if you were you know agricultural and, and grain would rot in the granary and, and things decay um, and so it allows credit to flow even if we're not producing more and more and more a growing realm of goods and services it works in a steady state economy it's aligning what is sacred to us with our work in the world. What is sacred to us now is changing as our mythology changes. Our mythology creates what is sacred. What was sacred was this program of control, of dominating nature, of, but no longer. Now what is sacred to us is this beautiful living planet, and that is 
for the dominant culture something new. Looking around at our world, it looks pretty hopeless. It looks like the institutions that run the planet have more power than ever. The military industrial complex, the surveillance state, despite our realizing 30 years ago that deforestation and climate change are a deadly peril, we've continued to pump CO2 into the atmosphere. We've continued to cut down the forests. It seems like we're helpless to change. Um, uh, in the last 30 years, despite our awareness of colonialism and, and um, uh, social injustice, these problems also have just gotten worse. So it seems like that it seems like we're moving in the wrong direction. But underneath the surface, uh, the ideological core of our civilization, the stories, the mythology, they are hollowing out. We don't believe in them anymore. Even the politicians don't believe their own rhetoric. They're just kind of going through the motions. So we're left with the shell, the hardened but very brittle shell of our system. But the core has hollowed out. It's very much like the Soviet Union. Um, in the 1960s, they fully believed in the superiority of their system. Khrushchev said, we will bury you. And it wasn't bravado. It was obvious our system is superior. You will be left in the dustbin of history. Um, by the 80s, the Soviet state was just as firmly entrenched, but none of the elites believed their own ideology anymore. It became very brittle. And when the moment came, it disintegrated. And I think that we are approaching that as well. The ideological substructure of our system has shifted. No one, not even the people in government, not even the elites, not even the 1%, are wholeheartedly enthusiastic anymore. Well, maybe some of us are. Um, you know, I, I had a conversation with uh, some MPs today. Uh, and they were like, you know, like the people in the townships, you know, the people in the rural areas, they want nothing more but to fully join this program that you say is obsolete. You know, they want the BMW, you know, they want the status symbols, they want uh, modernization. They don't want solar power, that's second rate. They want to be hooked up to the grid, you know. They want all of the things that you say that are becoming obsolete. And if you tell them that they can't have it, they're going to see that as just more, um, you know, protection of your privileges. Um, so, it may be that the story of separation hasn't fully played itself out yet. Uh, but also we have to look at the context for those people wanting those things. And that hit me as I walked into the airport in Johannesburg. And there I was standing in line at immigration or, or customs or at the baggage claim. It was at the baggage claim. And there's this enormous electronic billboard in the airport advertising, I think it was a Mercedes Benz, um, basically saying, um, you know, you need this. This is the good life. Uh, so, you know, it's like that, that ruthless competitive game that we've set up. We've set that up for, for pretty much the whole world. And we can't say that, well, that's what people want, you know. Uh, they want to get those chairs. That's just their nature because we set up the game that way. So I think one thing we can do if we are among the privileged classes uh, is to change that story uh, by example and also through our policies, um, which means coming to some humility. And that's happening. One way to come through humility to humility is through humiliation. Uh, <laughs> looking at the, the, the failure of this project. Um, in my country, it's getting more and more obvious. Uh, the um, depression, the suicide, the anxiety, the addiction, uh, all among the people who have won the rat race, who are at the top. This paradise has turned into a hell. And that is bringing us, along with the ecological crisis, is bringing, bringing us to a state of humility, where we no longer, in the guise of development, say, let us tell you how to live. 
Here, our life is the good life. Our ways are the best ways. Our education is the best education. Our medicine is the best ed medicine. Our ways of knowing are the best ways of knowing. And, and I know better than you that this planet is just a rock with a biochemical scum on top of it. Uh, and that this, and that, that you're thinking that this rock has consciousness, that's an anthropomorphic projection, a primitive, childish thing to think, because our ways of knowing are better. Look what we've created. Well, look what we've created. We're, we're coming to doubt that. Um, so I'll just throw that in there as well, that the revolution that we're in goes all the way to that level um, of how we see ourselves and how we see the universe and everything in it. That's how deep it goes. So thank you.